nästa föredrag det handlar då går in kring PEM-frågan mycket mer på djupet. Och det är alltså professor Betsy Keller från Ithaca College i USA som ju har en bakgrund och utbildning just inom fysisk träning och forskning i anslutning till fysisk träning som ju har en stor relevans för MECFS och PEM och hon har ju också gjort arbeten i anslutning till det som hon kommer att berätta om. Bland annat så har hon ju utvecklat tekniken med två arbetsprov som ligger på, med två skilda, två skilda dagar så att säga för att man ska kunna bättre studera PEM och det berättar hon närmare om. Det kan, finns också skäl att eh, påminna om ett av hennes uttalande och som ju Christian var inne på lite grann. Eh, hon skriver ju i, i en av sina texter att, och en intervju också att, eh, att idag med flera års kunskaper upp till åtta år i varje fall grundläggande kunskap om MSCFS så är det faktiskt idag intellektuellt pinsamt att hävda att MSCFS har är beroende och har uppkommit som en psykologisk sjukdom. Och hon kommer att ge mer underlag för det i sin presentation. Hon är också sedan 2017 knuten till Kunmei University i USA som ju är ett av de centra i USA som ju har alldeles särskilt fokuserat på MECFS. Men då är det tid att vi lyssnar på Bettys Kellers föredrag och precis som tidigare så är det inspelat och vi hoppas att hon kan ansluta, men vi vet inte riktigt om det är möjligt för henne att göra det senare. Så då startar vi presentationen med Betsy Keller. Good afternoon. My name is Betsy Keller and I'm very pleased and honored to present at your annual meeting, but regret that I'm not able to join you in person. I expect we're all in the confines of our homes or offices right now, but I think we are very fortunate to be able to connect remotely to discuss this important topic. I'd like to begin by disclosing that I'm currently involved in an NIH-funded study collaboratively with Cornell University um, to study ME. In addition, I conducted two-day CPET protocol on individuals with fatiguing illnesses to assess for evidence of impairment. What I'd like to discuss today is how PEM affects those with ME and how we can assess the impact of PEM, particularly with regard to physical function in addition to a few strategies to help minimize the symptoms of PEM. Unfortunately, I, have, I won't be able to discuss additional information that I have regarding some of these um, symptom management strategies, but I will provide that information to the Swedish Association for ME so that they can share it more widely with you. There are also a number of hot links in this presentation that I won't have time to explore, but I will provide the PowerPoint presentation as well for dissemination. A number of years ago, Tony Komaroff described post-exertional malaise, which is the primary symptom of ME, as the illness within the illness. And while there have been a number of definitions of post-exertional malaise, most of which include a long list of symptoms typically included in the post-exertional malaise response, I prefer to use the definition from the Institute of Medicine reported in 2015, which simply states that post-exertional malaise is a worsening of symptoms after physical, cognitive, or emotional effort. And that definition is ap appealing to me because it allows for the wide variability in the symptom complex that individuals experience, but also centers on the triggers that are common amongst the post-exertional response. In the recent International Association for CFS ME meeting, we saw a number of pieces of evidence to support the neuroimmune and autonomic dysfunctional aspects of ME. So for example, we learned that healthy muscle cells that are put into serum of ME patients increase their chronic level of metabolic stress. We also learned that B cell receptor activity in lymphocytes along with other immune related factors collectively may provide a tool or a, a, um, an indication of ME in, in individuals as well. And lastly, we learned that 
the overactive lymphoblasts that we see in ME patients is, uh, are unable to meet the uh, energy demands above a resting level because they're simply exhausted at rest. When we look at the indicators of autonomic dysfunction, we learned that patients who were activity tracked for six months and improved their function over the course of the six months also showed an improvement or an increase in heart rate variability in contrast to patients whose activity levels decreased over the period of six months or didn't change where their heart rate variability also decreased or worsened over that time. We learned from Jim Baranek that tachycardia following exertion may contribute to the PEM symptoms a subgroup of ME patients may exhibit. And we also, on a good note, learned that oral rehydration, at least in children with a POTS or ME, POTS ME diagnosis, may be sufficient or as effective as IV saline to maintain cerebral blood flow in these individuals. An ongoing intramural study at the National Institutes of Health has centered on um, studying ME amongst uh, patients where I can't even tell you how many measurements are being taken. It's an exhaustive study. But a part of that study also involves a focus group of persons with ME to help better characterize the post-exertional malaise response that is part of the ME diagnosis. And in the most, the first and recent publication by this group, um, identified eight themes about post-exertional malaise and ME. And I'm going to share three of those themes that are specifically germane to post-exertional malaise. And the first is here um, that PEM is triggered by three broad categories of events, including cognitive stressors, physical activity stressors, and emotional stressors. The second theme um, was that PEM was impacted by pre-exertional symptoms in a baseline state for persons with ME. And what I mean by that is simply doing what appeared to be a relatively benign, very low-level activity, such as reading a book or listening to music, might be sufficient to exacerbate PEM later on and lower the threshold for triggering PEM thereafter. Likewise, physical activities, just analogous to casually walking around or maybe going shopping, and emotional triggers such as a sad event of a funeral or even a happy event of a picnic might be sufficient to um, lower the threshold for the exacerbation of PEM-related symptoms. And this was described by an individual in this focus group as two days after going to the doctor, my baseline was now exacerbated. It took much less to cause PEM. It could now be just having to get in the car and go get my kids, which is something I do every day. I am now unable to do because of that doctor appointment two days prior. So how does PEM affect people with ME? Well, the third theme reported in the study was that PEM has a wide range of symptoms, which I know you all know, but interestingly, the symptoms experienced daily or their daily PEM are not so vastly different from the PEM experience following a severe trigger such as a cardiopulmonary exercise test. And they both share three core types of symptoms, including exhaustion, cognitive difficulties, and neuromuscular complaints. So with regard to exhaustion, one individual described it as a flu-like exhaustion, really tiring. I used to be an athlete. I had a very intense job, so I would feel a lot of fatigue from those activities. But this is not that type of fatigue. This is a type of fatigue I felt when I rarely got the flu years ago. Only that flu lasted for a few days and not for the years they have now. With regard to cognitive difficulties, it was described by one as, I can be in a complete fog for a couple of days and it's hard to make any decisions or remember basic things. And regarding neuromuscular complaints, it's like having glue between my muscles and feeling bruised all over, like I fell out of a truck. 
So when these symptoms and the severity of these symptoms were mapped by this group, the daily symptoms are not so vastly different from the symptoms following a more severe trigger of cardiopulmonary exercise test, both with having exhaustion as front and center um, and also cognitive dysfunction, which is more intensely represented during daily PEM than even after a cardiopulmonary exercise test. Muscle aches and pains, likewise, are more intensely represented during daily PEM than after a cardiopulmonary exercise test. But also during daily PEM, we find more prevalent here than following a CPAT, the sensitivity to environmental stimuli such as light, sound, and smell. Moving on, I feel like I'm constantly assessing my energy level, and normal people don't do that. They get up in the morning, and they pretty much know that they can get through a list of things to do, whereas it can take me weeks to get two or three things done, sometimes not at all. So the unpredictability of PEM is a disabling consequence of PEM for most persons who experience post-exertional malaise and ME. And it's that unpredictability that contributes to the hopelessness and overall sense of loss that one might experience after a period of time of having ME. So while these features are widespread and include various body systems, the three core symptoms, exhaustion, cognitive difficulties, and neuromuscular pain, have consequences that can severely impact normal life and lead to the sense of hopelessness and loss. But by learning more about your own individual PEM and what triggers your own individual PEM, you can help to improve your coping skills to avoid PEM and perhaps reduce this sense of hopelessness and maybe capture a little bit of normal life. Not a lot, but a little bit at least. So I want to share with you this open-ended recovery questionnaire that the WorkWell Foundation delivers to their patients after having completed a cardiopulmonary exercise test protocol. And what you see here are four questions. Um, you may not be able to see them because they're quite small, so I'll read them. The first is, how did you feel following the first exercise test? How did you feel the day after the first exercise test? How did you feel following the second test and the day after the second test? How long did it take you to recover in days? and any other symptoms you might like to share. And as, as you can tell, the control subject had little to share on this questionnaire, a little sore and tired after the first test, uh, maybe a little tired after the second test, went home after the second test, did some housework, actually felt quite energetic, took me a day to recover from the two-day CPAP protocol. In contrast, the ME subject, nausea, dizziness, tired, headache, and this persisted and even worse in shortness of breath, uh, worsened as the exercise test commenced and it took this individual six days to recover from this test while they were experiencing nausea and headaches throughout. To try to understand the degree of impairment one experiences due to PEM and ME, when faced with a disability case, attorneys in the U.S. typically seek three pieces of evidence to objectively indicate impairment in persons with ME. The first is a tilt table test as objective evidence of orthostatic intolerance. We now know from the work done at the Bateman Horn Center that the NASA lean test, which is a simple 10 minute test that can be done easily in the doctor's office, might suffice or does suffice actually to indicate orthostatic impairment. So this is a low tech approach to the tilt table test. The other piece of evidence is a neurocognitive assessment, and the third is a two-day cardiopulmonary test, which is what I'm going to focus my discussion on after this. Um, both, uh, all three of these pieces of evidence are more or less objective indications of function and are necessary to establish a case of impairment due to ME and post-exertional malaise. I think it's also important for persons with ME to understand that the significance of having information regarding your symptoms 
and tracking of symptoms over time is very valuable in establishing a case of impairment and disability. And that the characterization of life before and after ME, your story um, before and after ME is also important in establishing this uh, impairment, evidence of impairment as well. And, and lastly, to monitor activities of upright activities, hours of upright activities, or HUA, um, through activity monitoring, which I'll mention in a minute, would be is very helpful to do this over time to further indicate impairment status. So a cardiopulmonary exercise test is an exercise test that spans about 8 to 12 minutes. It's not very long, typically done on a treadmill or a stationary cycle like you see here. During this exercise test, we collect all the air that you breathe out and analyze these expired gases for oxygen, carbon dioxide, um, and the volume of air that you breathe out. And these CPAP measurements are um, indicators of the effectiveness of your heart and your lungs and your muscles to deliver and use oxygen to produce energy. So what we learn from a CPAP is your ability for energy production. We get a laundry list, a very long list of variables, and this is not an exhaustive list, I might add, from doing a, a CPAT. But I want to draw your attention to this first one, which is VO2, or volume of oxygen consumed. And when it's measured at maximum exercise, we call it VO2 max or VO2 peak. Uh, analogous terms that you may hear are, are include aerobic capacity or functional capacity. They're synonymous with the term VO2 max or VO2 peak as well. Why is measuring VO2 max so important? Well, in and of itself, it is probably the most powerful predictor of mortality, a non-invasive measure of to predict mortality. It also is in, serves as an index of impairment, which I'll mention shortly. And it's a measure, as I said earlier, of energy producing capacity. When we look at the results of a cardiopulmonary test, we can use that data to help classify based on disease status. So for example, here, based on these variables from a CPAT, we can tell if an individual is experiencing cardiovascular disease or pulmonary dysfunction or a neuromuscular disease. But for um, Evidence of impairment, because peak oxygen consumption is a measure of energy producing capacity, we know from using the Weber classification, which has been around for decades, that when an individual is unable to produce even low levels of energy, that corresponds directly to impairment or severity status of an illness. This was originally developed, this classification scheme was originally developed on heart failure patients, but is used on um, patients with ME, patients with multiple sclerosis, whenever we're trying to establish an index of impairment based on oxygen consumption or energy producing capacity. We can also use ventilatory or anaerobic thresholds, something we get from an exercise test as well, to show evidence of impairment along with um, cardiac index, which, which is simply a measure of oxygen consumption divided by body size to correlate to severity status of an illness. Likewise, we can use ventilatory measures from a CPAT, in this case VE or expired ventilation, the amount of air that you breathe out per minute, divided by carbon dioxide production, which is a byproduct of energy metabolism. And we find that this ratio is often abnormal in individuals who have ME-CFS as well due to their autonomic dysfunction and their impaired ventilatory capacity. So the reason we do two consecutive cardiopulmonary tests on individuals with ME is because we don't learn anything about the post-exertional um, phenomenon when we do one test and send them home. So two tests allows us to first assess their baseline peak oxygen consumption measures and their oxygen consumption and anaerobic threshold, as well as those other measurements I showed you. Presumably this first test will provoke post-exertional response, and we have on the second day we come back and we measure the deleterious effects, if any, 
of the post-exertional response to exertion on day one by measuring uh, doing a CPAT on day two. So to be clear how we take information from a CPAT to indicate impairment, we have to first understand that what we get, as I mentioned earlier, from a CPAT is oxygen consumption, and that oxygen consumption is a measure of energy producing capacity. And we um, can measure, take that measurement of energy producing capacity and translate that to activities of daily living in this way. The measure of oxygen consumption has an analog expression of what we call METs, metabolic equivalent of task. So a MET is a unit of measure of oxygen consumption such that one MET is equivalent to 3.5 milliliters, milliliters of oxygen consumed per kilogram of body weight per minute. So one MET is 3.5 mLs per kg per minute. 3.5 mLs per kg per minute or one MET is the equivalent to the average resting energy expenditure of an individual. And we can consult published results of measurements of various physical activities to see what the corresponding MET level requirements are to do those physical activities. And they are included in what's called the compendium of physical activities. Here is a hot link to that compendium if you want to explore that at a later time. But in that compendium, you'll see that the MET level requirements to do a variety, hundreds of different physical activities, including household activities, self-care activities, sporting activities, and so on. An example of what you might see if you look at the compendium of physical activities include home activities such as cleaning and sweeping at a low effort that requires 2.3 METs, in contrast, carrying groceries upstairs requires 7.5 METs. Notably, sitting quietly while watching the television requires only 1.3 METs, but if you happen to be somebody who is a, a foot tapper or fidgets with your feet during that activity, it actually requires a high level, higher level of energy production at 1.8 METs. So let's explore how that relates to this individual, the 39-year-old female, who has ME-CFS. She completed two cardiopulmonary exercise tests during which we measured peak or maximum oxygen consumption at 10.7 mLs per kg per minute. Her peak heart rate was 120. Please note that based on her age, it should have been close to 180. Her anaerobic threshold oxygen consumption was 5.6, and her heart rate at anaerobic threshold was 84. Um, her ventilation was extremely low, enough so that I didn't even put the numbers in except to tell you that she reached only 22% of her predicted ventilation volume um, based on her age and sex, and this was true in both tests. Notably, this individual reproduced her cardiopulmonary test on day two quite nicely with the same very low peak oxygen consumption and same anaerobic threshold and same very low heart rate at peak effort. These data alone indicate that while this individual reproduced her, her peak oxygen consumption and anaerobic threshold oxygen consumption, that she has chronotropic incompetence, which is a very low peak heart rate, inability to drive her heart rate up with, when the workload increases, a very low exertion, um, exertional ventilation volume, and that when we looked at her hemodynamics, that is, in this case, her blood pressure in addition to her heart rate response. We found that prior to the exercise test, it was very low. She had resting hypotension. And during the exercise test, this should her systolic blood pressure, which is the driving pressure that pushes the blood from the heart down to the working tissue to deliver oxygen, stayed working tissue to deliver oxygen, stayed very low throughout the test. She, in fact, hit her maximum effort at 60 watts, which is very low. And at that time, her blood pressure was no different than a normal resting blood pressure. And she had a very low exertional blood pressure that was even lower on day two when we looked at her resting and exercise blood pressures. And stayed low throughout recovery on day two. So her ability to increase pressure to drive blood with oxygen to the 
working tissues was extremely poor. If we look at just her oxygen consumption results, what we find from this exercise test protocol is that her peak oxygen consumption of 10.7 mLs per kg per minute is analogous to 3.1 mets. If we look at the compendium of physical activity, we find that 3.1 mets of energy production is required to walk slowly downhill or to simply walk around an office environment, picking up things like your keys or your purse in preparation to leave the workplace. 3.1 mets. This was this individual's maximum maximum energy producing capacity. Her energy producing capacity when she hit her anaerobic threshold was extremely low at 1.6 mets. That's analogous to bathing while sitting or sitting and eating food or simply sitting on a toilet. So 1.6 mets at ventilatory anaerobic threshold means that she, we would advise her based on this cardiopulmonary exercise test not to exceed this VAT level of METs or a heart rate at VAT of 84 beats per minute. And that is equivalent to doing nothing more strenuous than sitting and eating. So it's unlikely that this individual would be able to tolerate normal daily activities of living because sitting and eating is a very sedentary type of activity amongst numerous daily activities of living. So strategies to minimize symptoms of PEM center around impaired blood flow and flow of lymph, um, compromise ventilation or ability to move air um, at rest and during exercise, and inflammatory um, responses to post-exertional triggers. And I think it's important to also recognize recent research that has come out that found sex differences in microRNA expression um, in individuals following an exertional stressor, a physical exertional stressor, in ME patients. What this means is that males responded differently to females with regard to their microRNA expression following a bout of, exer of, of exercise, which suggests that the therapeutic approaches we might apply to males may be somewhat different than what we apply to females. We may find that therapeutic approaches may differ between males and females with ME. So some strategies to minimize or mitigate the effects of post-exertional malaise. Compression garments help to recirculate blood back to the heart and um, oxygenate it and move it back down to the working muscles. And these compression garments have been used for years, particularly with athletes and, and also following surgeries to improve circulation as well. So in most studies of compression garments, they've used a somewhat low compression range or pressure range of 10 to 18 millimeters of mercury. Um, to give you a frame of reference, most pantyhose or tights that uh, women wear are somewhere between 15 and 20 millimeters of mercury, and in contrast to medical grade compression garments that may range up to 30 or 40 millimeters of mercury for individuals who have deep vein, deep vein th thrombosis or blood clots in the periphery or um, legs or uh, lymphedema. So getting compression garments with graduated compression so that the compression is not the same at all diameters of the limb. And um, finding compression garments that um, can be individualized in other, to, to the body parts is uh, not hard to do. So for example, we've got some tights here. You can get these tights that don't have the feet in them. Some individuals prefer not to have compression garments on their feet. These are arm sleeves and uh, this is a compression shirt. So you can compress all limbs of the body quite nicely with these compression garments, and they found to be very effective, particularly for people with them. Red light therapy or low-level laser therapy or near-infrared reactance therapy uses photobiomodulation to help increase oxidative metabolism. This has been shown through studies that um, red light therapy 
can increase um, energy production and stimulate the mitochondria, although we don't know exactly how it impacts the various signaling pathways in the mitochondria. The primary clinical implications for red light therapy include injury, uh, nerve pain, lymph nodes to help um, decrease edema and inflammation, and trigger point tenderness and muscle relaxation. So these devices are used routinely by athletes after um, activities, all types of athletes, I might add, and the cost of the devices varies from $30 to $90,000 for a light bed that you might see here. Um, another strategy to help improve symptoms associated with PEM or reduce symptoms associated with PEM that's gaining a lot of traction lately is called intermittent fasting or food timing. Um, some people get nervous when you see the word fasting, but the objective is to control the release of glu um, insulin and glucose and um, control glucose levels and increase fat metabolism, perhaps decrease overall calorie intake, especially for individuals who are obese or overweight, um, notably for individuals with ME to help rest the lining of the gut and improve, improve blood pressure regulation and sleep. Fasting may help to regulate circadian rhythms as well, which is uh, something that most ME patients find disrupted after having the illness for a period of time. There are many approaches to intermittent fasting, but probably the most simplest for most people to adhere to is to consume all of your calories, daily calories, consume them all within an eight hour period of time. For example, between the hours of 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Notice that this strategy is not recommended for everybody, individuals who have special conditions, blood pressure regulation issues such as diabetics, uh, or blood glucose regulation issues such as diabetics or eating disordered, pregnant or breastfeeding, should consult their doctor before beginning intermittent fasting. And um, dry brushing is also uh, an effective strategy to help move blood and lymph. Uh, it's something that can, is relatively inexpensive and requires the use of these natural bristle brushes. Um, can be practiced one to two times per week or less if skin is very sensitive. It doesn't take long at all to do dry brushing and the brush should be very, very light in application. This is not a heavy brushing of the skin. It's a very light brushing to just stimulate blood flow and movement of lymph. And the, these pictures show the direction in which you want to brush to help move the, the lymph toward lymph nodes for lymph node drainage. TRS is another approach that some individuals are taking and has become more popular amongst individuals with ME and other um, chronic illnesses as well. And it involves the removal of heavy metals are typically bound to fat and are not eliminated through normal means of elimination. So what TRS does is it uses zeolite to bind up the sequester and bind up the heavy metals and remove them through normal elimination and or the skin and hair. And you will find that individuals who have experienced um, this heavy metal sequestering may report uh, rashes that appear as the heavy metals are eliminated through the skin in addition to other normal means of elimination. Heavy metal toxicity is linked to a number of illnesses including autism, Alzheimer's, and brain fog. There is little evidence-based information to support TRS, but at this link you can get more additional information specifically about this process um, that's often used for cancer patients as well. And here's an individual's account who has actually tried TRS as well and experienced the rash I just described. So in closing, I think it's important to know your PEM triggers and you can learn more about your PEM triggers by tracking your activity and tracking your symptoms. 
and to use the information from activity and symptom tracking to begin to pace yourself, yourself at a level that will keep you below that threshold in which your PEM symptoms are triggered. To begin to individually characterize your own PEM experiences and know what triggers you is the first step to being able to avoid PEM altogether. And avoiding PEM altogether is the best strategy to minimize the impact of ME on your daily life. So the best way to manage PEM is to avoid PEM. And I guess I would describe that as to try to live circularly, not what you did prior to, to becoming ill with ME, which was living linearly, where you got up in the morning, as that one individual described earlier, um, and, you, and you did task A, task B, and task C. And at the end of the day, you ate your dinner and you went to bed. Whereas now you need to think about living circularly where you get up and you do a task, for example, making your bed, if that's important to, do, to you, recover from that task before you do another task. Recover from that task before you do another task. And make sure that those tasks keep you below your threshold level for triggering your post-exertional symptoms. Lastly, I wanted to just point out a recently published article which is a commentary on pharmaceutical interventions. I will be the first to apologize, maybe not the first, but I will be yet another person to apologize for the lack of progress in providing data-based or evidence-based strategies to address the symptoms of PEM. But admittedly, the majority of single intervention treatments have shown little efficacy and it may be beneficial, as described in this commentary, to explore broader acting combination therapies with a more focused precision medicine approach to support a systems level analysis of endocrine and immune co-regulation in this illness. So with that in mind, I'm going to leave you with um, this slide about Dr. Eleanor Ellie Stein's course that she provides online to her patients. She is a physician and a psychiatrist in Canada that has developed an online course that focuses on eight pathways to begin to understand your illness and better appreciate the threshold of tolerance that you experience due to this illness with regard to your diagnosis, sleep, energy, pain, etc. This is a hot link when you get this presentation to her website. This is a hot link to a recent um, account of Dr. Stein's um, Pathways uh, online course that was uh, described in a blog on Health Rising. And I encourage you to consider something along these lines but it will, because it will provide um, a structure and a cohesive pathway to help move through your illness in a logical way to better understand how you can manage your symptoms. And for that, I thank you very much uh, for your time and look forward to your questions Wednesday morning in the questions Wednesday morning in the panel discussion.